Hi, everyone. I think you're probably all in the right place. We are here today talking about how to visit archaeological sites like an archaeologist does. And I'm Elizabeth Hora. I am public archaeologist at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. And I guess that I'm kind of the titular archaeologist here. So today we're going to talk about how archaeologists like me visit sites and how we approach understanding them and also how archaeologists themselves visit sites to make sure that we're leaving the smallest impact possible. All right, so you should all be seeing my screen here. And just to start off again, I'm Elizabeth. That's me in the middle photo there. Um, that's me wearing my good hat. And I work as an archaeologist at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. You've already heard me refer to it once as SHPO. So that's just the shorthand I'm going to use. Today, I'm going to explain how archaeologists like myself figure out what happened at any given archaeological site. So when I come to a site for the first time, often I don't know anything about it. And it's only through using my prior knowledge of the people in place and methodically observing that site that I can create any sort of interpretation for it. And as anyone who's hiked with me knows, that interpretation definitely doesn't come all at once. It takes shape slowly with more and more investigation and even with research after I've left the field. So my goal today is to outline my process for you so that you can start to develop your own process for how you investigate sites. I'm pretty sure that the general steps we're gonna go through today are, um, are the same for any other archeologist you may meet, but I do know that we have other archeologists in the virtual room here today. So if you want to, you know, let us know what your process is and maybe how that differs from mine. There's no, you know, there's no wrong way to visit an archeological site unless you actually hurt the site. That's the wrong way. <laughs> so I've used the phrase archeological site a few times. How do you know what an archeological site is and how do you know when you found one? So different definitions exist, but for our purposes today, an archeological site is a physical area of any size where you can tell that people once existed. Usually people had to be in a place for more than just a few minutes to have had an impact that lasts the test of time. Um, but a few examples of like a very short-term site would be a place where someone stopped on a hillside to flint nap a rock, or a place maybe where um, someone dropped their pottery jar. These actions both make archeological sites because they leave debris behind that we can find. An archeological site can also mean something as big as the cliff dwellings over in Mesa Verde or a rock imagery panel along the highway outside Moab. There's a lot of variation, but these were all places that people stopped for a little while and left a mark on the natural world. So the photos here are different archeological sites all around Utah. You can tell that some of them are old and some are a lot more recent. Some have a clear indication of what people were doing there and some are a lot more difficult to figure out on first glance. Um, but we'll approach all of them in the same way. And uh, just to give you like a little heads up on the definition here, my definition for today, any place where people in the past left traces that they were there, the Utah, um, all Utah archeologists, however, use the site definition of at least 10 artifacts within a 10 meter area. I just said a 10 area, that's not useful. 10 meter area, I apologize. So all of these sites, no matter how big or how small, we approach them methodically before archeologists go out anywhere. They know some basic things about the history of the area and the history of the people who lived there. It's a good idea to know the kinds of artifacts and features that you might encounter with each of these time periods um, so that you know how those features that you find can associate the site with these time periods and with the people who lived in them. You probably already know a little bit about the timeline in your area. Um, for example, if you come across a can dump on the side of a road, you can probably guess that that dump postdates the invention of the car. <laughs> and it might be related to refuse disposal from a nearby town or even a ghost town. Similarly, if you find grinding stones, 
you can likely guess that the site was created by people before they got their food in cans. Not always, but it's probably a good guess. So today, it's beyond what we can handle in the course of just an hour to tell you the artifacts that are diagnostic of each of these time periods, but we can get into talking about some resources so that you can learn this on your own. Another big piece of information that archaeologists know before they ever get to a site is the environment. Utah is incredibly diverse in terms of our biomes and our geomorphology and all sorts of other things that just mean environment, right? We have raging whitewater rivers and we have placid lakes. We have 13,000 foot tall mountains and desolate Pleistocene lake beds. And over the 12,000 years that people have been here in Utah, things haven't always looked the way that they do now. Um, in fact, pinion pine, the, you know, that short tree that's really ubiquitous on the mountainsides of eastern Utah, um, it didn't even arrive in Utah until after the end of the Pleistocene. So people were here when we didn't necessarily have pinion all over the place. Um, so, you know, before archaeologists ever get to a site, they're familiar with the land in maybe general terms. So what sort of natural attractions land might have? Um, how it might translate into human activities, those natural attractions. For example, a river delta is a really good place to duck hunt and gather medicinal plants. A rock outcrop might be a good quarry for toolstone materials. You might not know specifically the name of the nearest spring, but if you know that a cluster of cottonwoods in the desert may mean buried water, then you're well prepared to investigate an archeological site. So when you're out hiking, just take note of the natural world. And as always, you've just got to be a curious person. You've got to ask people around you what they know about the natural world. And you've got to always keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, keep reading. All right. So say you've been hiking and you think you found something, a cluster of flaked obsidian, a rock imagery panel, just something. Get the site in your mind, your, your imaginary site. Um, oh, and before we go too much farther, just a quick sidebar. I know the most about prehistoric archaeology, so I'm going to focus on that. But I want you to know that historic archaeology is all over the place here in Utah and across the West, and it's really important to our history. So just bear that in mind the next time you find a bunch of old glass bottles or insulators. Those are part of an important archaeological site, too. But my examples, I, I am going to use prehistoric artifacts because that's the way that I, I think the easiest. Okay, so you've got your site in mind. Maybe it's historic, maybe it's prehistoric. Um, so you've come up to that site. Now what do you do? So like I said, archaeologists approach every site really methodically so that you can be sure that you're not going to miss something. You'll get better and better at this with each site that you visit and your own personal flow for how you look around you will develop in time and repetition. Um, but honestly, archeologists, we start with checklists. We have forms, pages and pages of forms that prompt us to remember to look for a lot of different things that we'll get into. Um, and we look for them regardless of the type of site, features, artifacts, even things like soil or sediment depth. Um, so there's a lot to remember, and if you need to write it down, you're not the only one. I write it down too. <laughs> so um, just like you're going to methodically run through that your checklist, we're going to run through that all just a little bit right now. So what are site features? I mentioned that is you know the first on my personal checklist. Um, just a second reminder, I'm a prehistoric archaeologist, so here is a very abbreviated list of possible types of prehistoric features. Um, it's really by no means an exhaustive list, but it should help you to figure out what archaeologists mean when we say feature. So what is a feature? A feature is generally an immovable, constructed, or human-modified thing of some sort. Some archeologists actually refer to features as site furniture, and that's really not a bad way to think about it. Site features are great because you know that when you come across them, this is where people who built it intended that feature to be. You know that past people really put down roots at a site when you find a feature. 
oops, pardon me. So each of these um, types of features has a lot to say on its own. They can also help you understand the other artifacts that you might find on a site. So now I'll skip to this. So <laughs> our office is actually making a few of these handy guides to types of features and artifacts that will walk you through exactly what information can be gleaned from the various things you'll find on a site. There are, of course, a lot of ways to approach archaeology um, as storytelling, as a religious connection with ancestral kin. The way I personally approach archaeology is as a science. I find it easiest to understand things by looking at their attributes and quantifying them in some way. So here's an example of how we can do that with rock imagery. And you might call it rock art, perfectly fine. I'm going to use the term rock imagery for this presentation. So here's an example of you know, what I look at. I look at the patina and the repatination, so that sort of oxidized surface. I look at the subject matter and the style, the material, the methods. So does this answer every possible question that I may have about rock imagery? No, absolutely not, but I'm comfortable with that. Um, I'm not privy to understanding what indigenous rock imagery means. Um, there are people who are, I'm not one of them, <laughs> um, but I can answer a lot of other different questions that I think are interesting. Like I could probably figure out the average distance of this classic vernal style human figure to the largest village nearby. And that might help me answer anthropological questions about trade routes, ownership of farmland, or even kinship ties. So with every site feature, we have these kinds of things that we're looking for, different attributes. And again, we only have an hour and it would take a long time to go through all of them. But if you have specific questions, I can definitely help you figure out what archeologists are looking for when we find site features and what sort of stuff we actually record and then research later. So in summary, <laughs> when you've got a site feature, write it down or photograph what you've seen so that you can learn more about it later you're not going to know everything about a given site feature the first time you see it. So if you want to do archaeological science, you've got to record your findings. And I'm going to say it now, and I'm going to say it a bunch more later, but under no circumstances should you move or take anything from an archaeological site. And, you know, it would be hard to take a site feature. They tend to be pretty immovable. But people do try, um, and it makes a mess of the site when they try. So photos and notes should be sufficient because the site um, will probably be there for you to revisit later. All right, so that's enough about site features. I'm going to turn now to artifacts. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the kind of uh, the flashier kinds of artifacts, um, arrowheads, or what archaeologists call projectile points and pottery shirts. Um, but these sorts of things, these like really obvious artifacts, they only make up a small fraction of the stuff on an archeological site. Um, so here are some other artifacts to consider. Again, not an exhaustive list, um, but animal bone, maybe even animal bone that's been modified into tools, debris from flaking stone tools, um, non-projectile point sort of stone tools, so like a scraper or a biface, um, ground stone, and then it's, oh, this just goes on forever. It's a, it, this is an abbreviated list. If you want to learn more about the types of artifacts on a site, there's a huge wealth of information in books and even free articles that you can find online. Archaeologists are endlessly fascinated with these pieces of old trash because we've learned that the smallest details about them can tell a big story when we look at a lot of them put together. Um, so it's beyond what I can do today to tell you all about each of these. There are graduate level courses for each of these types of artifacts, and I bet even those don't exhaust all of the possible knowledge that's out there. But you're probably gonna find the sort of things that you really gravitate towards and that you enjoy learning more about. And you'll become the expert among your hiking friends in that particular category of artifact. Um, and we can talk later in the Q&A about different sorts of resources to sort of get you started. One thing that our office um, offers, again, are these artifact guides. Um, 
we're trying to give you just a little like bite-sized information as a starting point. So this is in general what you can learn from projectile points. And it turns out you can learn a ton from even one projectile point, even just a fragment of a projectile point. For example, the type of stone can help you learn about the seasonal rounds or the trade relationships that people had. Um, the, the base, that bottom portion, is where projectile points were hafted onto wooden shafts. And that can help you find out the age of the point, and that can help you date the entire site. So there's all sorts of information here on projectile points. And the same goes for potsherds. Although this guide is admittedly a little less bite-sized. Um, I started out as a, a pottery nerd and I think it kind of shows here. Pottery has a lot of different attributes that can be quantified, measured, and synthesized into that scientific reconstruction of the past that I was saying is really my passion. So for example, in the Four Corners area, archeologists were able to figure out that the growing size of serving bowls over time and the change in the location of their design was actually related to an increasing importance of communal feasting in those societies. So I think that's pretty cool. And that's the sort of information that you can learn even from just fragments of pottery. So when you've poked around the site, and seen the features and you've seen some artifacts, you can probably get a sense of um, what how people use the site in the past. Um, oh, you know what? Ah, there we go. Sorry, it's this guy again. Um, my apologies. I was like, did I mean to put him in here twice? And I did. I'm driving home the point that um, writing things down and taking photographs is a really great idea. Again, it's too much for you to try to remember everything you've seen at a site. I can't. So, you know, if you sit down and you sketch them or you take a photograph, that's really going to help you to remember what it is you were thinking about when you were visiting a site and do some more research, do some more sniffing around afterwards. And again, please don't take any artifacts, um, not as souvenirs, not come by my office and show me them in person and ask me about them. And not even if you find something and you're gonna turn it into the authorities before someone else can nab it, all of these things really damages what archeologists call the site structure. It's not, it's not enough to just know what the thing is. You kind of need to know exactly where it was found. Okay, and so now putting it together, the, the features and the artifacts. So when you've poked around a site and you've seen the features, you've seen some artifacts, you can probably start to get a picture of how people used the site in the past. You can start to understand the story that a site tells by asking yourself a couple of questions that I've listed here. So just a quick rundown of how you would answer some of these questions, because they're not always easy. You know, the first one, how long were people here? In Utah, across the ages, sometimes people used sites for just a moment, Sometimes they lived there for decades, and sometimes they repeatedly visited that site again and again for, in some cases, millennia. So one easy way to figure out how long people lived on a site is to look at the quantity and diversity of artifacts at the site. So if this is 20 flakes out in the open, probably it was just someone taking a break and knocking out a quick stone tool. If you have hundreds or even thousands of flakes, and you also have pottery and animal bone and charcoal and on and on, you're probably looking at a place where people lived for a while. Again, that's the diversity of artifacts. When you have that, in general, higher quantity and greater diversity of artifacts usually means that a site was occupied for longer or more often. Again, you know, that repetition, repeated coming out of site. The second thing you can ask yourself is what is the age of the site? Um, and just to give you a heads up, be prepared to not know the answer. I'll bet that about half of all archaeological sites in Utah are of some indeterminate age. Um, so why is that? Well, those sites lack what we call diagnostic artifacts and features. When archaeologists say that something is diagnostic, what we are saying is that it's analogous to symptoms that a doctor would use to diagnose an illness. 
Um, but our version is less depressing. So for example, projectile points are almost always a diagnostic artifact class because their silhouette is usually really indicative of the hunting technology that was in fashion at the time. So remember, we were talking about the base of a projectile point. The size of that projectile point, the shape of the base will often give you a range of, you know, maybe a few hundred, maybe a few thousand years of roughly when that projectile point was being manufactured. Um, there's a wealth of information available about projectile point types and how to analyze them um, that can help you determine the age and cultural affiliation of that point's creator. Likewise, some features can be diagnostic of age. Um, for example, like the charcoal remnants that you might find in a little smear of stained soil from a fire, ah, stained soil, I apologize, um, from a fire pit. That's a really classic example of a way to date a feature. Um, we can radiocarbon date that and get a general sense of the site's age. Some rock imagery similarly um, is also specialized to different ages and different cultures, certain types of architecture, different foodstuffs you might find on a site. If you find corn cobs, for example, you're probably looking at Fremont or ancestral Puebloan. So there's a lot of different lines of evidence to study. And so I mentioned that you're gonna find your own process the more you do this. And you'll also probably find the types of material culture that you like to learn about the best. Um, I actually like to visit archeological sites with my archeologist friends because we're all very specialized kind of nerds and we can put our specialties together and tell a better story about a site. So just a couple more things before um, we have a Q&A session and I wanted to leave a large Q&A because there might be some questions about how you can do all this. <laughs> the most important part of visiting a site is that we archeologists keep sites safe. Um, it's actually a part of like a ethical code that we all follow that we'll be good stewards of the past. We won't damage sites, we won't take things, um, et cetera and so on. We're just passing through in this life. And these sites have lived longer than us and will continue to live longer than us if we do things right. Um, in the field, archeologists actually go to great lengths to tread lightly on the land. Um, I didn't have a good picture of it and it's a shame, but I, I wanted to find a picture of the, you know, hundreds of times I've gone out with archeologists and we're hopping from sandstone patch to sandstone patch to avoid busting cryptobiotic soil crust. Um, I also didn't have like audio files to make a super cut of every time an archeologist has like picked a little bit of ground stone up that's been slightly embedded in the ground and another archeologist shouted, hey, do you have an excavation permit for that? Um, archeologists, we don't disturb the ground um, and we also don't take artifacts. And we try so hard not to leave a single trace that we were there. Um, so, I mean, the best I can do here is tell you a little bit about the pictures that I do have, that I have chosen. Um, so the image on the left is from Nine Mile Canyon, whose archeology span we're celebrating here today. A private landowner wanted to discourage visitation on their property. And they made a very clear point by painting over prehistoric rock imagery. They do get their point across, this belongs to a private individual and they will do whatever they want, not whatever makes you happy. You trespasser, you. I don't know if you could hear my extra S when I said trespasser. Um, most of the time you're going to find sites that are on public land. Um, these sites don't belong to you. They're left in your care to be a guardian of them. That's what we mean by being a steward. Uh, you wanna be a guardian of these sites. You wanna protect them. So the middle photo and the photo on the right are trying to get the point across of being a protector and a guardian. In the middle photo, uh, that guy's name's Chris. He's looking at rock walls and his hands are pretty conspicuously to his side. There's no need for him to put stones back in place that have fallen or to look underneath them to see what mortar people might have used. Um, quiet visual observation can be very meditative sometimes. And when you free yourself from interacting physically from touching too much these things, it actually opens up the mental space for you to really examine certain features and artifacts. So were these stones, um, were, they, were they stones that were collected from around here? In this case, yeah, they were. 
Um, were they shaped? Sometimes when people shape stones to make, um, to make uh, architecture like this, it's because they intend to be there for a long time. So more rough cut stones mean a more temporary structure. Um, you know, what kind of stone tool or what kind of tools might've been used to shape them? These are things that we can all get by just quietly observing. Again, you don't necessarily need to touch. And the picture on the right is taking this concept one step further. This is an archeologist who's measuring a rock um, that actually has rock imagery, petroglyphs on it, um, but it's been damaged by target shooting. So that archeologist is honestly just out there taking notes. Um, they're, they're writing down their observations to make this a science and not just screwing around. All right, harping on about not damaging sites is no one's idea of a good time, I know. But at the very end here, I just wanna give you some actionable tips um, so that you can get out there on sites and know concretely, this is, this is the best uh, practice for visiting a site. Um, obviously leave artifacts in place. Leashing your pets is a good one. Um, I hike with a dog and he does have to get leashed on sites or left off of sites entirely because he's a silly billy and he will run all over the place, pee on things, his paws make a mess. Um, <laughs> and you know, for rock imagery, you want to look, but don't touch rock imagery. Um, I, you've probably heard this before, but rock imagery has a fragile ecosystem on the surface and it's disrupted by the dirt and oils on our hands and fingertips. So you'll almost never see an archeologist touch rock imagery. There's really specialized contexts where we'll intentionally touch rock imagery. And we've usually made an attempt to talk with the, um, the indigenous descendants of the creators before we do that. So um, I would recommend, you know, again, that quiet meditative non-touching mode that archeologists go into. I would recommend that you try to um, cultivate that within yourself when you go to rock imagery sites. And again, you can get really close up to it. Um, you bring a loop, get really close and look in on it. Um, but, uh, but please try not to touch it. Um, if you'd like to learn more of these tips, Friends of Cedar Mesa has a really wonderful website for, um, for they've got like 15 tips. It's, it's incredible. And they're all things that as an archeologist I do and I hadn't necessarily realized it. Um, so you can visit friendsofcedarmesa.org slash tips for visiting with respect. All right, <laughs> we made it. Um, that was a lot of presentation guys. I actually had a section about sediments and soils that I had to cut or else I would put you all to sleep. Um, so we could circle back to that if you want, but do you guys have any questions that I can try to help out with? I have a question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned the cryptobiotic soil and then the last slide there showing Cedar Mesa. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they allow, um, open grazing on Cedar Mesa. So what about all the damage that the livestock makes as opposed to what we might make as a hiker? You know, how do you, how do you balance that? Oh, well, don't step on the soil because you're going to damage it. But then they've got these animals free ranging on the same area. Yeah, sure. Um, honestly, any animal has an impact. Um, wild horses uh, weirdly have a greater impact than cows just because of the way their hooves are shaped or the way that they strike the soil. But every animal does have um, some impact, including humans, including our cars when we go um, driving along these roads. So I think the important thing to know about that is that those are managed effects. Um, it's true that grazing in the West has contributed to Arroyo down cutting, soil erosion, um, certainly damage to cryptobiotic crusts. But we have to balance, especially on BLM lands, it's their mission to balance multiple uses of those. Um, so it's not a satisfying answer, I understand, but I think the best thing that we can do is, um, you know, maybe not eat meat and, and stay on the trail, um, not not making that impact any worse than it already is. Um, does that, does that answer your question? I, I, you do have a very good point there. Cows are disruptive. 
No, thank, it was nice to actually ask a professional. So I, I appreciate your answer. <laughs> thank you. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, the professional answer is that's BLM land. We balance it. You know, you don't have cows on national park land. You don't have cows um, in certain other sorts of areas. Um, it's just a balance, you know. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, how do you respond to the question, what does it mean? That's a really great answer. So this is something that um, professionals talk about all the time. Uh, I don't know if uh, my colleague Savannah is on, but we actually just had this talk like yesterday. Um, we get asked all the time, what does this mean? Particularly about rock imagery. Um, and I understand why. I mean, they're, they're meant to convey a meaning to someone. And it seems like we're eavesdropping in on that conversation that occurred centuries and centuries ago. Um, there are living descendants of those communities today who when they go to sites or when they go to rock imagery sites in particular, they do know what that conversation is. It's not eavesdropping for them. They are, the in, they are some of the intended audience. Um, I'm not a member of that community, so I don't always know that. Sometimes I know because my friends have mentioned it to me, but um, you know, for something like that, when, um, when there does seem to be some sort of symbolic meaning, I can't necessarily get to that. Um, that's where archeological science comes in. Um, maybe I'm not looking for meaning, but I'm looking for why people do something. So I can tell you maybe why rock imagery is there. Maybe rock imagery is in a place um, because it's functioning like a road sign. It's showing people nearby like, hey, here's the nearby settlement um, and either keep moving along or, you know, come on in and, and say hi. Um, it could be showing people their identity like, hey, just so you know, like we're, we're of the sheep eaters. So if you're a fellow sheep eater, come on in. Um, you know, if you're opinion nut eater, like, let's not, we don't historically have a great time together. So let's not, um, you know, there's a lot of different things like that. And I can start to see some of those meanings through archaeological science. So um, how do I respond to the question? What does it mean? On a case by case basis, sometimes I know what it means. And sometimes I don't. I hope that helps Marilyn. <laughs> Yeah, and if I can just add to that really fast, Elizabeth, we were talking about this yesterday, as you said, and, um, you know, we don't always know what it means, and it's not always appropriate, because, um, you know, we're not the descendant communities, and so we shouldn't say that, um, but also, even if we don't know what it means, doesn't mean it's not valuable, right? It's still an important remnant of past cultures, even if we don't know the meaning, um, so they're still important resources, and sometimes it's kind of a bummer not to know what they mean, but they're still really, really cool and um, important resources. That's a good point because we can't know everything. And so I definitely don't know everything. And just because I don't know it doesn't mean it's not important. That's a really great point. Thank you, Savannah. Thanks for jumping in. Um, so someone else had asked about um, those artifact guides. I put a link to them in the chat. So it actually will link to a Google Drive folder where you can find them as photos like JPEGs. You can also find them as I think the Adobe Illustrator files, the raw files, um, and as high quality PDFs. So I hope those are really helpful. Please spread them around to like far and wide, everyone you know. And if you have um, artifact guides that you would like to see made, let me know and I'll work on making those. Um, we've got a batch of five right now and uh, we can definitely make more. Um, Celeste asks the really important question, where is the line between trash and artifact? Um, you know, the Venn diagram there of trash and artifact, according to some people, is just a perfect circle. Um, anything is an artifact. This is a little eraser that came from a, uh, a pencil, like a mechanical pencil. My toddler ate it, so it's on my desk now. This is an artifact, and this would be really interesting if you found it out somewhere. It'd be like, this is a eaten piece of eraser. Did people eat erasers? You know, like it's an artifact. It's a thing that says something about the people who made it and used it. It says that a, a baby thought it was delicious, I guess. I don't know. But um, 
anything is an artifact and trash is our most valuable category of artifacts. I have worked on sites personally that are landfills. Um, I worked on a landfill up at a uranium mill in, um, in Washington state. We were seriously excavating people's, people's garbage um, and in a landfill, like exactly where they thought they were gonna put their garbage. It's, it was really fascinating though, because we were able to see what people didn't necessarily talk about, right? Um, there's something called the Garbage Project that was, I think, based out of the University of Arizona in like the 80s, 70s, 90s, sometime like that, where they went door to door and they asked everyone in the household what their um, food consumption habits were, had them fill out a questionnaire, and then asked to see their garbage for a week. It turns out people um, overestimate the amount of meat they eat because meat is sort of a prestige item. And so these people would say like, oh yeah, I definitely ate meat, you know, at least once a day, sometimes twice a day. And their garbage didn't bear that out. Um, so there's uh, there's a difference between the, uh, the message that people are projecting consciously and outwardly and then what their trash says. So when we move into the historical period, we have an arbitrary definition of 50 years for garbage, but that's not because the garbage itself becomes more valuable as it ages. That's because we learn more about the past when we're a little bit distanced and removed from it. So um, that 50 year mark, you know, it's a give or take. Um, I would say that some of the uranium sites, uh, you know, like the one I was on that was active through the 70s, that's not 50 years old yet, um, but that definitely is a historically important site. And so, you know, trash versus artifacts, it's all the same thing. It's all trash, it's all artifacts. <laughs> um, Greg Meldrum asks, what is your favorite artifact you've seen in the field and why? Oh, yeah, geez, man. I don't know. I mean, the one that most people think is coolest is I did a dig in Egypt and I found a little Ushabti, a little, little figurine, yay high. Um, it's a little statue of the person who had died. And uh, the thought is that you call on those statues in the afterlife to, to basically do your chores for you. Um, anything unpleasant that you would have to do. If you didn't feel like doing it that day, you call on your Ushabti. So People would have hundreds of them, um, you know, 365 is how many they're supposed to have, one for each day of the year. Yeah, sometimes sometimes people had 365, sometimes they didn't. Um, but for each day, you could call on your little doppelganger. Um, so that's personally my favorite artifact. It's not particularly a, applicable to North American archeology, span but it's, it's one of the coolest things I've found. Liz, may I ask a question, Elizabeth? Yeah. Um, hey, hey, hey. Um, so I, we were talking about the difference between human impacts and animal impacts on sites. And I was wondering if you could talk about the impacts that Nine Mile Canyon um, has been subject to when compared to another canyon that's had access restricted to it, like Grange Creek Canyon, which is a limited number of um, guests. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Cappy. That's a really great point. So um, yeah, again, talking about impacts. Um, everything we do is, well, not everything, but most of the things we do is damaging, right? Um, and so in Nine Mile Canyon, it is, first of all, it's a really amazing canyon. For any of you who haven't had the opportunity to visit, now is the perfect time of year to do so. We usually um, all gather down there in the canyon on a weekend in September, but due to COVID, we're doing this instead. So I highly encourage you to visit it on your own because right now that has a paved road, which, um, you know, roads are a potential impact. Um, so Cappy's talking about Nine Mile Canyon and then there's an adjacent canyon called Range Creek Canyon. Um, I believe it has dirt roads in it, but they're not as well used. So, you know, the normal, the normal problems for any environmentalist, um, there's trash at certain sites. That's always a bummer to see. And, you know, trash can sometimes 
chemically alter the soil, which could be problematic if you wanted to learn something about the soil later on. You know, soda will um, <laughs> will take the crust and crud right off of a car battery. So imagine what it's doing in the soil. So yeah, it's not great. Um, there was some thought that the dust from cars might be falling onto rock imagery and causing a, a, a problem with it. It's a little less clear that that's um, actually happening. The BLM had a commissioned a study a few years ago to determine how severe that impact was. And that study came back and said, it actually, we didn't see a lot of dust attaching itself to the rock imagery. So that's good, but also eh, why, why take the chance? Um, visitation is another big one. Uh, Range Creek was um, privately owned a lot of it for a really long period of time. And now it's still owned by the University of Utah, BLM and CITLA um, all own kind of checkerboard portions of it. And people don't go out there as much. So we don't see as much impact. Um, in Nine Mile Canyon, you see people who've put their names on rock imagery. Um, I don't know of any, uh, any illicit digging, which is good, but you know, we did some excavations like professional archeologists and that does create an impact. You're never gonna get those artifacts back in the soil in exactly the same way. Um, we did do a very good job of excavating though. Um, and so as archeologists, we sort of balance that we have to cannibalize our data set in order to learn from it. Um, so I think that balance was highly appropriate in that case. And we did have a lot of partners um, Tim Riley will be here, same bat time, same bat channel next week, talking about that if you want to learn more. Um, but yeah, Cappy, it's a really great point. We do have a lot of impacts to the canyon. Um, and part of what we do here at Nine Mile Canyon Stewardship Day is we come together to talk about those impacts and come together to really celebrate the good we're doing in reducing those impacts and um, teaching other people about the canyon, about how to visit with respect. Thank you for bringing that up, Cappy. And Cappy, by the way, um, is a member of the Nine Mile Canyon Coalition, which is a really fabulous organization. Cappy, I don't know if you can put your, um, like a link or anything in the chat, but that would be great if anyone wants to learn more about what those guys do and join up. Um, yes, I'll put the link to our website, um, Nine Mile Canyon Coalition in the chat box. And we are, are an organization that's dedicated to the preservation and um, protection and public education of Nine Mile Canyon. So if you're interested, please check out our website. And uh, I look forward to potentially meeting you. Thanks. Thank you for answering my question, too. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so long-winded. <laughs> um, <laughs> We have a couple of other questions in the chat, but I wanted to actually skip ahead to one that Kirk has mentioned because it's Nine Mile Canyon specific. Um, he says that there's increased signage at some of these sites, um, like the owl panel. And he's actually found people who were damaging owl panel and he did exactly the right thing and got information like uh, their car plates and photos um, thanks, Cappy. It's in the in the chat. Um, and got their their information and reported it to the BLM. That is perfect. That's exactly what you need to do. Um, don't do anything that endangers yourself first and foremost. You know, if anyone seems like they would uh, be unhappy about you taking a photo of them, don't try to record their license plate if possible. That's actually really helpful information. Um, and then report them to whoever the landowning agency is, the BLM. Um, you can call our office if you're not sure and we'll help you out. Just email me. I'll put my email in the chat here, Ebora at utah.gov. You can find me that way. Um, so he, Kirk is saying, you know, it might be that increased signage that's encouraging people to stop at the panel who wouldn't otherwise, who might not see it and might just drive by it. So is increased signage a good or a bad idea? Um, maybe it's not such a good idea, he suggests. I don't know. I do know that the increased signage was um, an idea that's been in discussion for a long time and that the BLM has made that decision because a lot of people want to know about the resource. And, you know, I, I, I don't know how many people found benefit from the sign versus how many people damaged the site in response to the sign, right? But, um, 
we've we we decide to take these sorts of risks because we feel that the reward is great. We probably feel like enough people saw that site and really appreciated it for what it is, which is a very cool rock imagery panel. And it probably taught them a little bit about respecting sites in general. Um, and it probably taught them a little bit about the people who lived in the canyon. And maybe that's not a tangible good in the world or an immediate good in the world, but I do think that that is a positive force for good. Um, you know, the most we can do is give people the value statement of why they should protect archeological sites and let them do what they're going to do. Um, we're, we're certainly not restricting anyone's freedoms in these sense, um, but you know, making an impassioned plea to people to please be a good guardian of these sites for us. It's a shame to hear that people weren't, but thank you for doing the right thing, Kirk. So we've got about 10 minutes um, and we've got a couple of other questions that I'll, I'll get to from the chat. Um, Trace asks, what is my favorite Utah artifact? That's really, that's a toughie. Um, hmm. One time I thought I found corn and I did find corn, but it wasn't prehistoric. That would have been my favorite had it not dated to 200 years in the future because of radiocarbon dating and we all have too much carbon-14 in our bodies. Um, <laughs> so my favorite Utah artifact, I don't know. I've seen a lot, but I've seen a lot in um, museum collections. I know which one. In Nine, it's actually, it actually might be from Nine Mile Canyon. Um, it's at the Prehistoric Museum. Again, Tim Riley next week, he'll be talking and he is curator at the Prehistoric Museum. I did not find this, but I was responsible for driving it to its resting place at the Prehistoric Museum. It is a winnowing tray from um, the Ute time period. So I think probably like 1500 onward. Um, and so when you had like seeds, nuts and berries, you would use this tray and kind of shake it to, to winnow that down to, um, to separate other plant matters from the food that you actually wanted. And it's really beautiful. You know, it's probably like, I'm making the big arms here, you can't see, but um, it's it's rather wide. It's kind of clamshell shaped um, and it's just super cool. <laughs> um, I don't know how else to explain it. Go down to the prehistoric museum and see it. I'm sure they've got some good COVID restrictions in place. So be aware, but um, it's very cool, very cool artifact. So that's my favorite Utah artifact. Um, <laughs> Angeline asks, how far back does three, the 365 day a year go? And when did 365 start? Holy moly. Um, I'll do some research for you on that one, Angeline, because that is actually a big question and it's not going to be the same for all cultures across all times. Um, so for, you know, what I knew about Egyptian stuff back in the day when I first started out, um, the 365 day a year is, you know, several thousand years old. Um, they actually conceptualized it as a 360 day year. And then they had five days of like bonus days. Um, and plus, you know, that extra sixth bonus day every so often so that they could get their calendar right. Um, but uh, yeah, man, that's a really, that's a big question. The 365 day a year. Um, so Savannah asks <laughs> my favorite rock imagery panel in Utah. And I, she knows the answer. It's actually a rock imagery panel that we had the opportunity to see um, really recently last week um, that has about 13 projectile points on it um, because I just thought that was beautiful. And it's image, it shows a little bit of how people, how someone else sees the artifact that we're so familiar with. Um, archaeologists look at projectile points all day, but we can never, you know, get into the head of the person who made it. And so this is the closest we can do is having someone do a, a graphic representation of, of that artifact. Savannah, do you want to hop in? Oh, no, I was just wondering. <laughs> um, that was quite an amazing panel. So it's also my favorite, I think, as well. Yeah. And those things change, but yeah, it's very cool. 
Um, if anyone wants to ask their questions in person too, that would be really great. Because <laughs> so it's not just me having a conversation with myself. Um, um, like maybe Angeline, you you had a question about relationships between archaeologists and tribes. Do you maybe want to voice that? Sure. Um, so uh, what I was wondering is, I know relationships between the tribes and uh, researchers has been strained um, historically, and I'm wondering if you're seeing any um, more cooperation between the two um, in recent years, if anything has changed in that regard in, in a positive direction, and maybe even what what is being done to make to facilitate that. Thank you, Angeline. Um, that's a really fantastic question. It's a really hot topic in archaeology. How do we create um, collaboration, not just not just asking someone, hey, what does this mean? And absorbing that knowledge for our, our own benefit, honestly, but making meaningful collaborations with tribal groups. Um, it has been getting better over the last few decades. It has a long way to go. Um, historically, archaeology is a product of, um, of racism and of colonialism in particular, where uh, archaeologists studied people as um, not, not true people, but uh, oddities. And they commodified the information that they got from people and they commodified, honestly, the artifacts. Even the famous Indiana Jones quote, it belongs in a museum. Not necessarily. <laughs> it's, you know, an artifact is where it is and like, it's, it's fine right there. It doesn't necessarily belong in a museum. And if it did, that would be a point of discussion with the indigenous groups who are the traditional owners of, of that thing, whatever it is. So Angeline makes a really great point. Like it, relationships have improved mostly because archeologists have figured it out that um, it's not responsible archeology span to take and take and take from the people who are the descendants, to take information, to take knowledge, to take the, the physical things themselves. Um, in rock imagery, I know of one example um, from a few decades ago, it was actually my undergraduate advisor, Wes Bernardini. Um, he was working with the Hopi tribe to look at Hopi ancestral migration, even as far north as Utah here, um, and how they recorded their tribal migrations, their clan migrations, in stone. And so he was looking at Hopi clan symbols and I actually helped him record a site that had just hundreds of Hopi clan symbols from a, a particular era of time. Um, and so this was a project that was developed between my advisor, Wes, who is not of tribal descent and the Hopi tribal um, preservation office, the cultural preservation office, I apologize, Hopi cultural preservation office. Um, they're TIPO. You know, I work at the Shippo, tribes have a TIPO. It's awesome. <laughs> and so um, they had worked together to decide what the goals of the project are, how the project will be conducted, um, and how that information will be disseminated in such a way that mutually benefited the both of them. And so we're trying as archaeologists to do that more and more. It takes time and it takes the development of personal relationships. And it's something that um, is, is a big commitment for everyone involved, for archaeologists and for tribes. And so we are also having to understand that tribes sometimes don't have an interest because they've frankly been used in the past or they don't have an interest because it takes a long time to, to do this kind of work. Um, and when the interest isn't there, we as archaeologists, the hardest thing to do is to walk away from that project and say, all right, um, if we can't mutually benefit, maybe we don't pursue it. That doesn't always happen. Um, obviously, when we have projects, particularly on federal and state land that have to go forward, they have to go forward. Um, and so we, we do try to get tribal input at the very least. Um, but I would say things are improving. Um, it's by no means perfect. So thank you, Angeline, for that. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks. And Marilyn responds, this new generation of younger scientists can change the relationships and paradigms. Absolutely. And I, I wanna help them do that. 
Um, um, Carol, actually, Carol, are you still on? Would you like to just say hi? And, and you're a retired federal archaeologist. I'd love to hear from you about um, your comment. She may not be on. Okay, well, we've only got a couple more minutes and I there are um, quite a few questions in the chat. So I'm really excited that you guys are talking so much about um, issues of what archeologists call cultural patrimony, who owns the past and how the past should be used. I think that's exactly where everyone's heads, in my opinion, should be at because um, archeology span for too long has been, like I said, racist and colonial. And uh, we haven't done a really great job of thinking in these directions. And so I'm so, so happy to hear that you guys are thinking in those directions. Um, and just one more thing that I wanna part on. If you're interested in um, seeing more archeological sites, talking with more archeologists about the work that they do and becoming a, a you know, really out front their guardian of the past, um, you can become a site steward. We are starting up our site stewardship program that will be statewide. Uh, we're working on all different kinds of land jurisdiction, BLM, Forest Service, national parks, state parks, et cetera. If you'd like to learn more about it, um, you can go to bit.ly slash site stewardship interest. Um, you do have to have those capitals in the right order. So I'm putting it in the chat because it's, you know, it's a long phrase, site stewardship interest. Um, that will actually get you on a mailing list. We're just starting the program. So it'll get you, um, it'll get you started on like how we're developing it. Um, it'll let you apply to be a site steward as soon as we have that. And we are um, trying to match people with the best sites that they want. Um, we've got 100,000 sites here in Utah, we can probably find at least one that you're going to like to work on. Um, and so thanks in advance for going to that website and letting us know that you want to become a site steward. And thank you everyone who joined us. Thank you so much to the Nine Mile Canyon Coalition and to Project Discovery who are um, co-hosting this series of talks with us. Um, please do come and join us for Tim Riley's talk next week. I talked about this a few times. You can go to bit.ly slash it takes a child um, to learn more there. And I'll put that in the chat as well. It takes a child. Anyway, thank you guys so much. I'm, I was, I, this is thrilling to me. Thank you so much for coming and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's been great. Thanks.